It must be the end of the day there. <laughs> yeah, we are really tired. Can you hear me? Oh my gosh. Yeah, can. can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Jaime, we are here today. Um, it's about uh, 5 5.30 in the afternoon. 60, 60 Spanish teachers are here um, in the University Menéndez Pelayo in Cuenca in Spain. They traveled from all over Spain to be here this whole week. They are teachers that teach in bilingual programs, English, but they are Spanish speakers, native Spanish speakers, as you are as well. Um, and they want to learn about technology and how to use technology, Google, of course, in their classroom. They work with children from K to six, so from three years old to 10 years old, and that's the range. And they are really excited and grateful to have you there. Leslie here is helping me out. Um, I live in Colorado, Breckenridge, and um, we're really excited to um, hear you. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's about 8 o'clock in the morning here, and you caught me in the middle of a uh, of, of vacation. I don't want to say it's vacation, but I, I just came from a long weekend uh, in Chicago watching the Grateful Dead concert, and so this is the first work oh. thing. <laughs> The, the, I went to, to three shows of the Grateful Dead concert, now I'm here, and I'm on vacation this week, but Becky asked me to do this because uh, she uh, she thought you guys were special, unique, so I figured I would jump on. So forgive the scruffy look and uh, me just, you know, being on vacation, but here I am. How you doing? I can I can talk about anything that you want me to talk about. I can talk about um, what Google's doing. I can talk a little bit about what's what what I think is going on in education. We can talk about um, uh, any any questions that you guys might have. Does that work? I assume everyone can see me. Okay. I see you guys, but I don't see your group. Yeah, you want to turn it around? We can do that. Thank you for that ride. I am not a rock star. I mean, and I just went to go see rock stars in, in Chicago. Um, the um, yeah. So so let's start. Let's talk a little bit about kind of uh, of what's going on in the world. The um, the the big thing is obviously there's a a, a big push with technology um, and. And I think one of the one of the things that we're seeing is uh, uh, an escalation of technology in education because it's become easy to use, right? Uh, it's become cheap. It's become uh, part of our language. It's become part of our world. Um, it's just something that that is inevitable to come into education. Uh, I've been at Google for nine years, and I've been involved in education for nine years while I've been at Google, and I've watched the growth happen. The, uh, the interesting thing that, the, why I'm excited about this is because it's for the first time, you know, you can actually have access to all the world's information, right? If we talk about technology, we'll start with the most relevant part of technology, which is the internet, right? The internet gives you the ability to reach information that you've never been able to reach before, right? The, when we were kids, when I was a kid, we used to have to go to this big box thing called the library and get books. Um, and we no longer have to do that. We now have literally every library at our fingertip. And, and so how do we take advantage of that? How do, we, how do we bring that into our classroom? So that's the first thing that's happening with technology 
is the internet and how do we incorporate what's happening on the internet into into our everyday ex instruction and, and so that's a big thing now um the, the the key thing there is to make sure that what we're not doing is we're not taking technology we're not taking the internet we're not taking devices we're not taking chromebooks or ipads and just putting it on top of our current system and saying that we're doing technology in education right because the truth is then what we're really doing is taking the old education model and putting technology on top of that and saying that we're advancing and we're really not, right? Because the truth is, it's not that technology is the focus of what's happening in education. Technology gets the most attention, but what's really happening is we need to look at education in the same way that we did 150 years ago and say, do we have the right model of education for the future, right? Are we building the skills, are kids building the skills uh, that they need for the future. I, I Here in the U.S., I was talking to a teacher a couple of weeks ago, and she said literacy was a big problem. Like, kids couldn't read at the grade level that they needed to read at. And so uh, we we're talking about one specific, a couple of her students, and she was saying that they were in high school and they were reading at a fifth grade level or sixth grade level, and that was a problem. And And yes, it's a problem, but it's only a problem because of the economy that we're facing. Um, you know, 50 years ago, reading at a fifth grade, reading at a sixth grade level wasn't that bad for you, right? Because you could graduate high school or secondary school, you could go get a job at the factory, you could get a job at, at, in, in, in a blue collar job and, and do really well. And you could work at the factory, get promoted, become a manager, have a whole team. Uh, and, and you can have a wife and kids and a house and, and a car and everything was there. And it didn't matter that you read at a third grade level or fourth grade level. You could survive, you could live and thrive uh, because we lived in a blue collar world. We live in an industrial world. Now we can see when people can't read because reading is important in this new economy and intellect is important. Knowledge is important in this new economy. Uh, global communication global competency skills are important. Language are important, right? Um, uh, I get asked all the time if uh, my 13 year old uh, is going to learn another language. And, and, I, and, I, and I always say, um, yes, Python, right? Uh, the, the, the future is in computer science, it's in programming, it's in not knowledge-based economy, it's in design thinking, it's in those things. And so, the, the, what we need to do in education is look at the best of what we've done over the last 100, 150 years and say, what of that is really, really good that we have to keep doing? And then look at the future and look at what kinds of jobs there are in the future and look at what kind of skills kids are going to need in the future and then apply a different set of school methodologies so that we can build the skills that kids need, right? And, and, the, and the skills are obvious, right? So I, I always talk about how um, I don't like to ask kids what they want to be when they grow up because the jobs do, the jobs don't exist. And more importantly, I don't want to, you know, it, it's funny. We, we talk here in the U.S., we talk about college and career ready. We have to make college, kids college and career ready. Well, most of the people that I know outside of education, um, and this is, this is true, but most people I know outside of education don't like their jobs, right? They ended up working in some space that they don't like, and they're always trying to get out of that. I don't want to create a generation of kids that just go through jobs, right? I want to create a generation of kids that are problem solvers. And so instead of asking our kids what you want to be when you grow up, we should ask them what problem you want to solve. And then that changes the conversation, right? When you ask a kid what problem you want to solve, you no longer are asking that kid, what do you want to, where do you want to go work in the future? You're asking them what autonomy do you want to have? What purpose do you want to serve and what mastery do you want to create like what 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 is it that you want to drive towards and it gives kids a different set of expectations right all of a sudden you're saying what is the problem that you want to solve and the problem doesn't have to be world hunger or it doesn't have to be um you know solving uh, the 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 financial crisis in greece right the, the the problem can be making blenders quieter, making cars go faster, uh, making cars use less gas, whatever that problem is, asking kids what problem you want to solve changes the conversation. Because now you can say, well, what do you think the knowledge, skills, and abilities are that you need to solve that problem? 
And how do you get those knowledge, skills, and abilities? Um, and then you can bring in technology into this. And you can say, well, who should you be following on LinkedIn and on Twitter and on Facebook? What blog should you be reading? What what um, what swipe website you should you be subscribed to? What updates? You know, I have my Twitter is set up so that you know I get updates from specific people when they tweet, so I know what they're talking about, what they're saying, and what they're publishing. Right? It's it's a whole new ball game of of developing the knowledge, skills, and abilities. I can take a class in anything in the world. I can learn to do any. It's like the it's like the Matrix without the thing plugging into your head. Right, you can you can literally learn anything that you want to learn at any point in time, and so that changes the conversation. And so, in that world, in that context of kids that are solving problems and developing the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they need, what does an education model look like for that? And when and when when you spin it like that, then it's it's clear and obvious that what we need is a student-centric learning model, right, where the student becomes the center point of what what learning looks like. And, and that's the individual angle to that. The second part of that is that we need to teach real collaboration skills, right? Because we talk about collaboration in education, but we don't mean it, right? Because it's my 14-year-old who has, I keep calling him 13, he's 14. He, uh, I, keep, I keep calling him 13. He's 14 and he's got homework, his assignments, his tests, his grades, and then he graduates and we say, good luck. Right, go work with others, and so the the um, the real collaboration that we need to teach our kids has to happen in in school, where um, they can ask really, they learn how to ask really good questions, they learn how to question facts, they learn how to vet information, they they learn how to build consensus, uh, they learn that part of what they do is only greater with the sum of the group that they're working with. Right. So, you know, imagine as teachers, you hand out a test and at the end of that test, uh, two kids come up holding the test together and saying, we decided to combine our skills and work on this test together. Right. Um, and, and I'll flip that into my world where I would go to Larry and Sergey, the, the co-founders of, of Google and say, here's the education plan. I did it all by myself. Right. I didn't ask anyone. I didn't talk to anyone. No, I swear I didn't talk to any of the other teams. I did this all by myself. So it doesn't work in the real world. So real collaboration is the ability to ask good questions, to listen. Real collaboration is the ability to change your mind. Real collaboration is the ability to build consensus. And we are not doing that in education. And so when we think about the future, the future is a world where the most critical elements are going to be around innovation and iteration, right? Um, I think my wife and I created like four companies in our heads on, on the way back from Chicago this weekend, right? Um, you know, just you're always thinking about different ideas and, and different uh, approaches. Are you guys still there? Okay. All right. Sorry, you froze it for a second. As long as you can hear me. The, um, uh, the, 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 real, the real future is about iteration and innovation. And so um, that's what I think is what we need more than anything in education is a culture of iteration and innovation, right? I usually put up a picture of the original google.com. Hang on a second. Let me see if I can do this quickly. Um, I put up a picture of the original google.com and I highlight the fact that this, 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 this is uh, what Google looked like at the beginning. Hang on one second. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can uh, improvise here real quick. Um, and and then I and I, I'll show you. I'll see if I can put up this picture and show it to you because it's it's critical to think about what my kind of my my main point here. And then and then I'll answer any questions that you guys have. But but what's critical here is um, let me see if I can do this correctly. Uh, all right. Well, I'm not a screen share. Now I'm starting to print everything. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll, you want some help? <laughs> cool. So if you can see that quickly, that, that part right there, this is what Google looked like um, at, at, the, uh, at the beginning, right? This is a bunch of computers put together by Larry and Sergey. 
And this is what Google looked like at the beginning. Now, this is what Google looks like today. Wow. Look like at the beginning. And then it, 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 this is what Google looked. It's not that Google looked like this on Monday. And then this is what it looked like on Thursday. This took 16 years of communication, collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking, all the things that you need in education today. And more importantly, this is not what a data center will look like 15 years from today. Because if it does, then we're dead. There is no data center, right? It, just like there is no classroom, there is no education. It's we need to stop thinking like that. We have to, we have, there is no classroom of the future. There is no education of the future. I don't believe in any of that. What I believe in is a, a, a group of dedicated, committed educators focused on their kids in their school who want to give them the very best of what's possible. And, and they, they're going to continuously innovate and iterate around those kids to provide that to them. That's what education looks like in my head, right? And, and, and so I'm not looking in education. We tend to look for the perfect model or, or just show me what the perfect model looks like. And I'll just go do that. And the truth is that that doesn't exist, right? The truth is that it is, um, it is this constant iteration, this constant shift to thinking about, um, what's best for our students and what, is, what can we do for them so that they're always learning, they're always engaged, always, that it's always relevant and technology whether we like it or not, is part of that because this is a generation of kids who are growing up that don't know any better, right? They don't know that the, the world existed before Google. They don't know that the world existed before computers and smartphones. They don't know that the world existed before Wi-Fi, right? You know, we're going on our, we're going for a week starting on Thursday up to the cabin in Greer um, with a family, right? So it's, it's not just me, my wife, the kids, it's her parents, so it's a big family thing and in a big cabin. And I have not told my 14 year old that there's, wi that there's no Wi-Fi in that cabin. Like I'm afraid to tell him because he will try to hide when we leave, right? <laughs> the, just the idea of him being someone where there's no Wi-Fi. It's like saying to a kid, I'm sorry, where we're going, there is no oxygen. So you have to wear this oxygen tank the whole time, right? Like they have no idea what you're talking about. So, so that's, that, those are the kids that are coming into our school system. So we have to make sure we're ready for them. Anyway, I'll stop talking. Uh, that's kind of a little bit of what, the stuff that I talk about or think about and, and write about, but would love to answer any questions since I'm in the room with you guys and it's Spain and I'm sure the weather is beautiful and I've actually never visited. So I actually want to go to Spain. So I'm jealous that you guys are there. Oh, next year. We are formally inviting you next year to come over. <laughs> All of these teachers will come back, I promise. Yeah, Aren't you? You come back with Jaime? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have started collecting some questions for you here. Um, I can. Uh, yeah, well, some of them are kind of tricky maybe for you because here in Spain, the educational reality is different. And something you get every day is that teachers go to their classrooms and they don't have connection to internet. And sometimes they don't even have proper computers. So is Google doing anything uh, to provide some kind of a better access to school around the world? Uh, to internet, I mean. Let's keep in mind that this is a temporary problem, right? Even, even though you can feel it, right? It's a temporary problem in the sense that in 1995, only 1% of the world had connectivity to the internet, right? 1995, 1%. So that wasn't that long ago. It took 10 years to get to the first billion, five years to get to the second billion, and then four years to get to the third billion. So now we have 40% of the world online. That's still not enough, but we're making progress. Um, we are gonna get to the point where it gets really, really hard in some areas. And so we're gonna have to be innovative in how we provide internet access. So here in the United States, even not everyone has internet connectivity as well. I mean, it's better than most other countries, but there are some other countries that are even better than the United States, especially for high-speed broadband connectivity, which is really what we need, 
Um, so, so, so a couple of things. Google has partnered with a bunch of organizations to provide internet access, but we've also done our own stuff. So we, we just recently are piloting a program called Project Loon. So I encourage everyone to, to look at that, L-O-O-N. It's called Project Loon, L-O-O-N. And we're, we're, we're experimenting with balloon, launching balloons into space to provide internet access. Uh, and connectivity to rural areas that don't have access. So that's one thing we're working on. Um, we're also working, and I, and I hate the word to use the word drones, but those are what they are, um, using drones to provide internet connectivity to areas that don't have access. So we have a number of projects that are doing this, but I'll say this about internet connectivity compared to other industrial revolutions. I don't know if as, Amer as, as, as humans, we recognize the real power and potential of internet, right? And what it can do for commerce. We look at it as a nice to have, we look at it as a, yeah, I'm living my life. It would be nice to have internet connectivity, but it doesn't necessarily do anything for me. And, and that's not anywhere near the truth, right? I can start a business right now, this very minute on the internet, right? I can start a commerce, I can educate myself, I can do all these things. And the funny thing is when, the last revolution happened, the industrial revolution, we built these factories and these big buildings and everyone moved to the cities to work in these factories, right? The internet, the internet started and everyone isn't moving to the cities because that's where internet connectivity is. They're saying, I'm gonna wait here until you bring internet to me, right? So that's a different mindset than it was in the first revolution, right? And so, so those factors give us this gap in time. It's like saying during the industrial revolution, like, hey, those, those factories that you built in the city, that's great. Can you come up into the rural areas where we don't have factories and build one here for me so I could work, right? <laughs> we didn't do that during the industrial revolution. We're, we're doing that now. So it's gonna take longer because we're covering more space uh, in this revolution. So uh, we're, we're all working on it. In the meantime, hold on, in the meantime, most of our stuff works offline, right? So Google Apps for Education yeah. works offline. Um, Google Earth. Yeah. Oops, up, up, stop. We have a problem with the connection now. Is it? Go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Next question. Um, um, I was just curious, what was one of your best ideas after the Grateful Dead show, if you can share it? <laughs> or is it top secret? Because that's really cool. Uh, uh, portable gyms, uh, CrossFit. I don't know how big CrossFit is in, in Spain, but CrossFit is big here in the US. And we're, we're talking about like a company that goes around to all the CrossFit gyms and provides uh, like these out of the world kind of experiences for CrossFitters who are insane people already. And, and we, so we're talking about that business. But anyway, that's just one example of the different things you can do. <laughs> How crazy we can get. Um, the, um... You were talking about your children and how your children is going to feel or how he's going to complain about not having a Wi-Fi. Um, we're concerned about um, this question. Um, would you limit, or did you, in your case, limit the screen time uh, with your own children at some point? anything that we do moderation is key i have to limit screen time for me right like i want to i want to go i mean i'm i'm off today and 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 i have to work I'm, I'm i'm speaking at the white house in a couple of weeks and i have to and i have to write the the speech that i'm going to give there and and um I have to I have to moderate my work, right? Like this is supposed to be my day off, and here I am talking to you guys. And so and so moderation is critical for anything that we do, right? Like my wife moderates my work because I, I she's I, as soon as she wakes up she's gonna make me out of here. Uh, <laughs> and so and so I think moderation is important for anything that we do. So for my kids, absolutely, they have to have, you know, you have to teach them. The, the key thing here is we need to teach our kids how to cross the street, 
right? And, and the internet is this big giant street and we have to teach them how to cross it, how to behave on it, how to act on it. And if they're not learning this in school, where is it that they're gonna learn how to do this? They're gonna learn the wrong behaviors in other circles. And so in education is where we can teach them how to be good digital leaders, right? And that's absolutely critical. But yeah, moderation, absolutely critical for anything that we do, no matter, no matter what it is, right? Too much gym time is bad for you, right? Whatever, whatever moderation thing that you need, that, that's what we need to, to focus on. We have to also keep in mind one thing though, um, about these kids is two things. One is that we remember as we get older, we, we are forced to, to be like our parents and, and act like these, these kids today, they don't know A, they don't know B, they don't know C, right? So we gotta keep that in mind because the truth is that they are no different than we are. It's just a different thing that they're, they're addicted to just like when we were kids, right? And, and two, we do have to keep in mind that how they learn is different than the way we learned. And we can't force the way we learn onto our kids. We have to accept the way they learn, right? And, and that's just something that... And that's and that's just something that we have to we have to, to live by, right? And and I'm almost, almost guilty. I tell the story about my my daughter. Um, we were flew to Hawaii for one of our vacations, and she hated to fly. So I bribed her and drugged her up. And when we got to Hawaii, she got a ukulele because she's a musician. She plays instruments. And we're walking out of the store, and this is like a couple years ago. So this is in the middle of my role and what I'm doing at Google, and I noticed instruction books and videos on how to play the ukulele. And so I say, hey, do you want to buy a book or a video on how to play the ukulele? Because that's how I grew up learning, right? You, you went and got formal training on something. And, and she looked at me like I was insane because how is she going to learn to play ukulele? She's going to watch YouTube videos, right? Which is natural for her. And so we have to always keep that in mind that how we learn, how we learn how to do things is different than the way kids are learning how to do things today. One more question, the last, please. Okay, this question comes from Caesar here. Uh, Cesar, he wants to know how do you envision, how do you visualize the classrooms in the future, in the next future, if classroom brick and mortar are going to keep the same way or if you have a different vision of classrooms. idea of classroom of the future um, doesn't make sense for me because because here's here's the biggest problem I think that we have is that we we pretend like education is this formal thing that happens to us and then we stop doing it right I've been at Google for nine years in the nine years that I've been here you know we bought YouTube we launched Gmail we launched Google Plus we launched Hangouts we launched uh, Chromebooks we launched Android we launched Android tablets we launched Google Play you know just in nine years that I've been here, the world has changed dramatically. I can't stop learning, right? The idea that I can stop learning at some point. And I remember when I was done with graduate school, I said, I am done learning. I never have to learn again. And nothing could be further from the truth. We have this idea of what learning should look like, that learning happens to us as opposed to something that we control. So where I see the future is this idea that we, we're, you know, how many, how many of you say, that you wish that you went to college in your 30s and not right after high school because, or after secondary school, right? Um, because you know more and you know how to behave more. So, so take that same attitude and now sprinkle it throughout all your years, right? So that potentially you take a couple of uh, post-secondary school to get you started on whatever career you wanna go and whatever problem you wanna solve. And then every year you take a certain amount of time to learn new things. Uh, it becomes part of your, of, your, of, your, of your learning. It becomes part of your kind of career that every year you're learning something new because that's the world that we live in today. So, so I don't see a, a change. Look, at the end of the day, I have, I want, yes, you're, my, you're a teacher. I want you to take my kid all day. I, it, you know, your job, go, go. Go take care of my kid. But in that in that time that you have my kid, how does that become uh, student centric? How does that become about what the kid wants to learn? How does that become about what you think the kid should learn 
around the critical skills of problem solving and critical thinking and, and, and all the things that we want our kids to know how to do. Um, I Just the last story here, and then I would encourage all teachers to look in a little bit into computer science. We tend to shy away from computer science because we're not engineers and we don't know how to do computer science. And the truth is you don't have to be a computer scientist to, to manage or to facilitate a group of kids learning computer science, right? Think of it as being a soccer coach or football coach or a basketball coach. You know, you don't have to be uh, messy to, 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 to teach kids how to play football, right? The, 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 the idea is the same in computer science. Uh, great thing about computer science is that if you can guide students, they can learn together and they can help each other. Uh, I'm starting a school here in Phoenix, Arizona, inside the school district called the Phoenix Code Academy. And it's going to be an inquiry-based school where kids are going to learn project-based, they're going to learn through project-based learning, but the projects that they're going to be working on are computer science projects. And so they're going to take, you know, English and history and science and all the regular classes, but they're going to do it in a, in a collaborative project-based way, and they're going to learn computer code computer science at the same time so that when they graduate secondary school they're going to have skills in in deep learning but also in computer science and 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 so those kinds of combinations of things is what I see the future having holding for us Thank you so much. Uh, well, our, our, the, this group of teachers were already very motivated, very committed, and I guess after this talk, they are going to be 100% into this technological change into the classroom, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm really grateful because today with this piece of talk you gave us, uh, you help us a lot, and it's going to spread probably. Uh, all through throughout Spain and we hopefully will see you next year here yeah and say thank you to your wife gracias uh, <laughs> and to you of course for taking vacation time for us thank you very much Jaime well, thank, thank you very much for having me you can you know we can always keep conversations going on Twitter I'm on I'm at Twitter at JCASAP, or just call as soon as possible. Uh, but the um, but we can keep conversations going on Twitter, on on Google Plus, and other places. But just the last thing I I, I want to say is thank you for having me and inviting me in. Um, and and I'm really excited about education because the teachers you have in this room, whether they like it or not, um, they are the generation of teachers that are creating the future learning models. You know, right? You, they're the ones who are building what learning is going to look like in the future, and and that's a pretty uh, uh, awesome responsibility. And and the uh, and 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 for the first time in the 150-year history of education, we're seeing a shift to a more student-centric learning model. And the teachers in your room are going to be the ones that drive that. So thank you very much for having me. Ciao. Adiós.